How are you guys today? Are you excited? Yeah. I'm super, super excited. Um, welcome. I am, as Jesse says, Stacy from New York Magazine and Vulture. Very honored today to speak to a woman I greatly admire and whose work is consistently great, which, as we know, is not always the case. Uh, so let's welcome, please, Holly Hunter. <laughs> So nice to have you here. Oh, thank you. It's really nice to be back. I was just saying to Annette, my publicist, that the last time I was here, I had a fever. Oh, I no. remember. <laughs> feel I feel good. really good today. You're not, you're, you don't feel big sick today. Sorry, I just had to, had to throw that in there. Ready. <laughs> Speaking of, have you, has everyone seen the movie? Oh. Isn't it amazing? Oh, oh great. Yes. Oh, thank you. So great. We will obviously get to that in a little bit. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about your life growing up in Georgia. What was that like? What were you like as a kid? Um, well, I, you know, I was, uh, I had five brothers and one sister, um, so it was a heavily male-influenced <laughs> household. Mm -hmm. But my mother was quite strong, so, um, <clears throat> and my sister had a, a huge influence on me as well. So we were outnumbered, <laughs> but um, the female thing was, was potent. Hmm. Um, so you learned early on to stand your ground, essentially. Well, I think, you know... Yeah, I, I think I, I did, although I was not a rebellious kid. Mm -hmm. um, I was not a rebel. I didn't really, I wasn't a major rule breaker. Um, but I think, it, you know, growing up in a really sexist environment um, where the boys worked on the farm and the girls were not allowed to, uh, I had my own kind of existence there on the property that I kind of made up. Hmm. My brothers didn't have that opportunity. They had to do chores. They had to do farm work. They had to take care of the cattle. They had to bale the hay. And so my thing was more kind of moving invisibly around, <laughs> you know, were you making creative? up my own thing. Were you creative? Did you daydream? Did you, you know, were you a performer sort of early on? Um, you know, I just did the kind of a normal kind of regular thing of, I, mean, I started doing plays in high school, which I loved. I mean, I, I love the whole idea of children engaging with high school productions. I mean, just that whole drama club thing. Mm -hmm. It felt very free where you're playing, uh, you know, uh, where you're playing grandmothers hmm. and you're 13, or you're playing <laughs> like you're, our town, where yeah, or you're playing the dog, mm -hmm. or you're, 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 whatever, whatever. I mean, I, I loved that that departure. Hmm. And were your parents encouraging of you to be creative, despite the sort of labor intensiveness of you know your, what your brothers were doing? <laughs> yeah, very, very much so. Oddly, very much so. Um, they, I mean, I was kind of in search of. And a, a kind of art, an artistic expression, a definitely, from a young age, from around fifth grade. I was looking for a way to express myself creatively, uh, singing, um, pian playing the piano. Uh, so I was, it was musically, a musical search, and then I found acting. And, I, and, and that was just the jackpot for me. I mean, it's kind of a personal jackpot. You know, I was like, wow, this. A lot is, of people have won that jackpot. This, this is so <laughs> cool. You know, it was just so cool hmm. to, 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 to get that major yes um, in, inside myself. It was just fun. And when was your first performance where you felt that, where you were on stage and you thought, wow, I, I could really get used to this. I want to keep doing it. Well, I, you know, probably when I was in fifth grade, we did a scene from Helen Ke We did a scene from Miracle Worker, and I played Helen Keller, and I was like, oh, that's it. <laughs> you know, it was like a really dramatic scene where Helen You'd was... you seen the movie. Obviously. Yeah, I'd seen the movie, and, you know, where she's like, it's a huge tantrum, and she's tearing the room apart, and it was just really fun. <laughs> It's a very physical part. <laughs> <laughs> very physical role, yeah, with a lot of rewards. And, and I read, and again, I have to always check this because you can't believe everything on the internet, that you were in a poultry judging contest as a kid. Is this true? 
Yes, oh, I, you what know. What is that? <laughs> well, you know, um, um, when I was growing up, and it still is very much in existence, but in rural communities, is the 4-H club. Um, right. And it's kind of a, it's an agricultural um, community program that, you know, was in the schools. And so, and I, I, you know, was in horse and pony and public speaking, but I also did poultry judging. Um, <laughs> Now, is this poultry? I and you laugh, but <laughs> I was very good. Are you judging live? <laughs> You're judging live animals, not not what we would buy in the store. You're live. Judging live. Okay. Yes, okay. live. Okay. Bro <laughs> broilers, fryers, <laughs> um, I, a, eggs in the shell, and broken. <laughs> it's a distinct skill to have early in one's life. Yes. And <laughs> when you were deciding where to go to college, um, how largely did theater figure into your decision to go to Carnegie Mellon? Because obviously it was a, you know, very well known for its Exclusively, theater. exclusively. Okay. Um, I remember uh, I went to my high school counselor and uh, I was just talking about like, a, you know, how could I possibly get into Carnegie Mellon University? And he was like, you can't. Um, <laughs> You know, you you're you, you've got to you got to think of something else. Why did you say you can't? Because you know he, un, unbeknownst to him, you know Carnegie is a conservatory, so you you don't have to have fabulous grades right. um, uh, unless you're applying as an engineer, and then you have to be a genius. But if you're applying uh, applying as an actor or an actress, then all you have to do is audition. Right. But he didn't understand that. <laughs> It's kind know, of a big piece of the puzzle. He, he was thinking about yeah. SAT scores and right. stuff like that, which I was only an average student. So, um, but I uh, I went to Pittsburgh with my father and did a, a two day audition process mm -hmm. and and uh, and got in. What did you perform? I, I, does anybody else? I mean, wow, that's so distracting. <laughs> I can't see it. I wish we could kill that. <laughs> could we kill that screen? Anyone? I mean, I it's so like, oh, wow, issues. I have to look at myself, too? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Do you recall? Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Do you remember what you performed um, when you auditioned at the school? Did you have to have a monologue prepared? I, um, uh... I did, I did something from The Death of Bessie Smith by Edward Albee, and then I did um, uh, Carson McCullers, A Member of the Wedding, which is a role that I, I, just, I, I so wish that I had done, and I never did. That was, you know, a cool, such a beautiful play. And what do you remember them saying to you in the room? Was it an immediate, you're in, or was it this? You know, we'll let you know type thing. Oh, no, no, no you know, that's, that's a, a total formal, you know, environment right. where they've got hundreds of kids coming in and auditioning, and no way would they do that. Right. You know, it was very, you know, specific and, you know, in the box, you know, they, uh, procedurally. Hmm. So, yeah. And how did you feel when you got that letter or the call that told you you were accepted? Um, well, you know, I... Of course, I was thrilled, um, and and really, you know, that was it, it was a very different thing. Then it was much more um, brutal. The, the 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 conservatory system was a more brutal system than it is now. At at that time, I mean, y you know, they accepted sixty six kids and they graduated seventeen of us. Wow. So it was it was That's like really <laughs> fear based. And, you know, there was a lot of fear as to who was going to make it, who was going to get cut, who was going to ask to, who was going to be asked to leave. I mean, wow. that whole thing permeated the system. Whereas now, I think it's far more conducive to um, encouraging actors, you know, to take chances. And to, I, I think then it was, it was people were scared. Doesn't seem like a great environment for you know, eliciting creativity from people. Well, I think it was really, really um, high intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, was, there were great things about that too. You know, I mean, I think stress is a, is a beautifully 
creative um, state. <laughs> I mean, to be highly stressed, you can be extremely creative in, in, in within that. You know, I don't believe in eliminating stress altogether. You can't first, you know, firstly, you can't do that. Um, but secondly, I, I do, I think that it's real, a powerful motivator. Um, it's, it's, it's great. And how did that training prepare you for uh, moving to New York and pursuing acting there? Um, wonderfully in many ways. I, I, I think that, you know, you go through a four-year professional training school for acting. And when I got to New York, I was like, I get to be here. Hmm. I, I am entitled to walk in these rooms. I'm entitled to sit and audition. I'm entitled to ask for stuff. I'm entitled to, 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 to know what I want because I know what I want. And, you know, I mean, there were, there were things that I knew about myself. And I think self-knowledge as an actor is um, really necessary, ne very necessary. I mean, acting is, I think, a tremendously insecure making pr profession. You know, I always feel insecure. And I always feel confident. I mean, they're, they're, they're both slammed up against each other. And, and it is a constant balancing act for me, you know, because I do operate from fear. I am afraid, oh, you know, frequently, you know, when I'm, when I'm performing, when I'm, when, when I'm playing a character, before, when the camera rolls, before I go out in front of an audience. Um, uh, that's something that I'm always negotiating with. Do you guys relate to that? Yeah. Fear, yeah. <laughs> I'm not an actor, but I, I relate to it as well. No, but yeah, I mean, oh. fear, I think, is, is something you, you, you live with as a, as a performer. And at what point did you meet Francis McDormand? You were friends in New York, yes? Um, Fran and I, uh, my boyfriend, um, and Fran's boyfriend were best friends. Mm -hmm. So I met my boyfriend uh, doing a play, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and we were playing opposite each other. Mm -hmm. And so I did this play in St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri, the Repertory Theater of St. Louis, the, Lo the Loretto Hilton at the time. And I came back to New York and then he said, hey, let's go up and to my best friend is going to um, Yale. So he said, so, so we went up to Yale, and his girlfriend was Fran, and so wow. um, the four of us like hit it off, got together, and Fran and I became friends. And so then we all moved up to the to the North Bronx in New York. Um, we we got two apartments. They lived together, and then we both broke up with our boyfriends. <laughs> and then we got rid of the one of the apartments, and Fran moved in with me. <laughs> And what was she like as a roommate? Fantastic. <laughs> I know. want to believe she's as magical as you are, but you know, you don't. Well, know no, no, no. Fran is, is is fabulous. She's as fabulous as she seems. Um, <laughs> she is that. I imagine uh, you were quite a support for each other too. Yeah, was, yeah. You know, we 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 had a blast, and then um, we 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 stayed up there for a couple of years, and then Fran did Blood Simple, and then Joel kind of sort of moved in with us, Joel Cohen, and, you know, because he and Fran, and then th they moved out, they got, you know, they eventually got married, but, um, yeah, it was a great uh, chapter. And we hear your voice in Blood Simple, but we don't see you. Right. Could, right. Tell us a little bit about that moment in the movie. Well, I mean, um, yeah, that was 19, God, that was 1982, <coughs> maybe 1980, I met them in 82. And then we, I did that little brief recording in, in 83. I, w I watched the movie again recently and I said, I know that voice. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's an um, indelible voice. Yeah, we were, we were friends. So they just said, will you, you know, do this, this um, um, answering machine message? <laughs> <laughs> did you get paid? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they asked a friend to do it, so they didn't have to pay you. <laughs> no. So um, I think it's <laughs> safe to say that 1987 was a big year for you. Um, hard to believe 30 years has passed since Raising Arizona and Broadcast News came out. Incredible. Um, so Raising Arizona, one of my favorite movies of all time. It remains so sublimely ridiculous and lovely and sweet. It's just as perfect as the day I saw it. 
Um, and is it true that the Coens wrote the part of Ed for you? They did, yeah. yeah. It seems perfect, perfect for you. <laughs> it's hard to imagine anyone else playing this part. So nice. Tell me a little bit about filming. You actually did film in Arizona. How long was the shoot, and did you have a sense of what this movie was going to look like afterwards? Oh, God, Because no. the tone is, I mean, it's very indelibly Cohen tone, but it's, it's so hard to pin down. I can't imagine what it was like to be shooting those scenes with the babies and those, like, Nick Cage running through the grocery store with the pantyhose <laughs> on his head. Like, all this stuff, like, only they could pull off, you know? Right, and, and, and also, I mean, I think that Raising Arizona that they had done Blood Simple and Blood Simple and Raising Arizona are they're they're of the same family but they're also very different. Right. You know, Raising Arizona is really whacked out. <laughs> and very silly and funny. Um, yeah. yeah. And I read the script and I thought the script was brilliant. You know, like brilliant. You know, there's not there's no there's no syllable that you want to change of the Cohen's writing. I mean, you want to memorize it verbatim, absolutely as they've written it. You want to change nothing. Wow. Um, <coughs> so, but nevertheless, you know, their stuff leaps off the page and then enters into another realm um, cinematically that mm -hmm. I didn't know. Uh, so seeing the movie was really different from having done it. <coughs> um, and I don't think that I really understood Raising Arizona hmm. until I saw it with an audience. Uh -huh. And then, it's in, in a way, it's like when I saw The Big Sick, I saw The Big Sick by myself, which actually I like to see movies that I'm in alone because the transition's difficult. The transition's hard, hmm. um, especially if I haven't seen anything of the, if I haven't seen dailies, then when I see the movie, I need to, I need for it to be a private thing because it's hard. It's understandable. <laughs> it's ex it's in it's intense, and so the intensity I can weather better if I'm alone, hmm. um, and then I can see it with people. Hmm. But nevertheless, a comedy needs you need to see a comedy with a crowd. Hmm. You know, it it has a different life sure. um, with an audience. And that alchemy between the audience and the movie is is it seals the deal. Hmm. And how difficult was it shooting with all those kids? I, I, I just cannot imagine. I mean, even just one baby, you have to have twins playing one baby, let alone you had a crib full of babies. Yeah, I mean, I think, this work? I think we had like 18 babies. Or, <laughs> oh my God. You know, and they were discouraging the babies from walking because, you know. Because <laughs> you didn't want them to seem too old because they had to be crawling. Right, and yeah. you guys know, I mean, when, when babies crawl, they crawl for a very, very very small window. <laughs> Crawling takes up a really tiny window in a baby's, right. you know, development. They want to get up. They want to get up. <laughs> so that was, it was crucial that all those babies still be in the crawling <laughs> mode. Do you guys remember the scene where, where High walks into the nursery and there are just babies everywhere? It's almost like a scene from Jaws where it's like, and the way it was shot was very low to the ground right. and it looked very scary. I mean, it's that really just so funny. I, I still can't believe that movie got made. It's just so special. And what was it like working with Nick, who obviously was, he was early in his career too, but just kind of right, right on the cusp as you well, were. Well, Nick, you know, is, is um, Nick is incredible. I mean, it, there is no actor like, Nick is a true original. Um, and he continues to be amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think Nick, Nick continues to like, be a thoroughly surprising actor. Um, and he completely shocked me as high. I mean, yeah. the way his interpretation of high defied whatever was on the page. I mean, he, he took it to a complete other stratospheric level. <laughs> he did. You know, he as did. he does, mm. as he continues to do. I mean, I saw, you know, speaking of Manglehorn backstage, David Gordon Green directed. A, a, a movie that Nick Joe. was in called Joe, so good. and I thought Nick was amazing he in was. Joe. That was one of his best performances. I mean, just I amazing, yeah. um, and it's and it's 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 extraordinary, um, you know, people's windows because mm -hmm. people do you do pass through your your whole life as a window, um, but creatively, you know, people's windows are can be a certain size, and Nick's just continues to defy. It does. Um, any time frame, you know, when, when, especially with somebody who is 
walk, walking a tight wire as Nick does with his choices, for him to continue to pull stuff out of a hat that you haven't seen before hmm. is amazing. It is. And are the Coens open to input from the actors? Uh, were oh, you, yeah. oh, totally. They are, okay. I mean, I'd oh, like yeah. to believe that they are, but... You and, know, and, and, no, absolutely, absolutely. And at the same time, you know, what you want to do is, you know, the Coens have such a specific idea of their movie um, that you want to fulfill that, mm. you know. But at the same time, you know, in, in, in no way did they imagine how Nick would play high. You, you know, I mean, once again, that's, that's a, a, a great, you know, example of their collaborative energy, you know, and their collaboration with somebody like John Goodman. Um, and Goodman is such an imaginative creature as well that, you know, that there's, there's ways that you can't, you can't know. And so Joel and Ethan cast actors and, and they know many things. And then there's a percentage that they don't know. They want to leave that's that 10% why they open. cast those, those people. Consistently brilliant casting in their movies. So Raising Arizona comes out in April. Were you already shooting and or were you already wrapped on broadcast news by the time that came out? Or what was the overlap? The, when, when Raising Arizona came mm -hmm. out? Um, I think... God, I can't remember. I was I'm, just wondering what the impact was of Raising Arizona on... Like, were people suddenly aware of you in this new way? And then obviously broadcast news opened Christmas, so was there an overlap well, in terms I, of... I remember that broadcast, I mean, that when Raising Arizona came out, there were people who were offended by the movie because it dealt with kidnapping in such a heartfelt way. <laughs> <laughs> they were very well-intentioned kidnappers. They weren't, Kid, yeah. you met them no... But there more. were people who did, that was no laughing matter. Interesting. Child It's funny, mapping. that never occurred to me until just now. That it was that like, was not cool. <laughs> So right. there, there were people who, who had a very difficult time with the movie and hmm. therefore a difficult time with me. Hmm. Um, and I was so, like, gobsmacked by that because it had never occurred to me in a way that, that I was even a kidnapper. I mean, <laughs> because the movie tonally is so loving. It is. <laughs> you know, so lovable. She just wanted a, a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of obliterated the cr the the criminal aspect. <laughs> I thought so too. You know, and being a cop and being a good cop, right? I thought even things out. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> and and tell me how you got cast in broadcast news because I have read that you replaced Deborah Winger again, making sure that that's true because I don't believe everything. But is that is that the case? Well, I mean, what what I think happened was you know, Jim Brooks went through this really tormented, I mean, he is a guy who, he, he does go through kind of a self-tormenting process that, that has always been incredibly productive and magical. Um, and he did that with, with broadcast news, as he's done, you know, many, many times in his career. Uh, like in terms of the script, like just laboring over it for a really Well, long I think time? he labored over casting. Um, oh, I see. Okay. So the, all I knew, I, I really didn't know the story about Deborah Winger, but I did know the story about that this movie was being cast for forever. Okay. Because um, I kept hearing about it. <laughs> I wasn't going up for it hmm. because they were looking for well known, established. And he had just actresses. worked with her on terms of endearment, so it seemed like a natural. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, it, it, whatever Jim was going to do would seem natural, hmm. um, except, you know, casting me. I mean, that <laughs> didn't seem natural at the time. But, um, I mean, I knew that he was looking for someone tall. I, he was looking for people who were statuesque. He was looking for, you know, is it because William Hurt was tall? They wanted someone to I match his height? I, I, that's always been a puzzle to me. Hmm. Uh, perhaps because I am small, but I've never thought of, like, why would you cast someone small or large? I, you know, right. that, I, that, first right. off, I mean, because, because size is such a, a, a non-entity on screen. I'm, when I meet people, sometimes I'm so shocked by how tall or small they are. Um, because it, it's, it's virtually meaningless on, on so it camera. It doesn't inform their performance to you when you watch Yes, it. the camera. And, and, and the stage does the same thing in a way. The stage can kind of, it normalizes everyone to a degree. Hmm. Um, so I always find that to be puzzling and 
meaningless. Right. Well, especially um, the character you're playing, she's not a supermodel. <laughs> I mean, she's a news producer, so naturally there wouldn't be a specific body type that would lend itself to that job. It, it, so. it, right, right. Yeah. I, I mean, if, if you want someone intimidating, size still may not have much to do with it, really. Yeah. Um, but he was looking for an actress of, with great experience, and, and he did what Jim Brooks does. He, he, he obsessed over it and continued looking. And then after six months of, of, I was still hearing about this project, and finally he just said, let the floodgates open. And so then I, I, mm -hmm. I came in. And I rewatched the movie again recently, and it's just, I mean, it feels more timely and relevant now than ever, frankly. Um, but your chemistry with William and Albert just, it, like, what was it like working with them? Because it seems so seamless, and now it's hard to imagine anyone else in any of those parts. I mean, Albert specifically, I mean, he, he is just, <laughs> he's just so tragic and sad and funny and just everything. All and, of those and, things. And in William's part, too, that's a hard part. All that he had to things. play. I mean, you know, um, an impossible part for yeah. anybody. And but to be endearing, but also sort of loathsome, and it's really tricky. No, what I mean, they did. you know, uh, Bill Hurd is one of our great actors. Yes. He He's one of the great actors, um, period. Mm. You know, I, he was a mentor to me, mm. whether he knew it or not, and I'm sure that he did. Because, but I, I... Did you know them before the production? No. Oh, you didn't? I mean, he was an, an extremely, extremely scary guy to be in the room with because of his talent, because of his incredible searing intelligence, his, 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 his relentless common sense. I mean, <laughs> Bill has sense. He sees things. He, he knows the truth. You can't hide from Bill. Um, I can see that. That comes across. Yeah. yeah. He's incredible. I mean, really, there is there is no one I've ever worked with before since mm. who has so much clear sightedness as Bill. You know, when you are when you're when you're acting, mm. um, he knows so much, uh, and that was incredible. It was it was a privilege, a privilege to work with him. And yeah. what did you learn about yourself as an actor making that movie that surprised you? How scared I was. That's the most scared I've ever been. Really? And Bill knew it, you know. <laughs> he knew that I, he knew how scared I was. Mm -hmm. And and he took care of me in many ways. I mean he, he really he understood the actor's fear and and how and how delicate it is, you know, and how formidable it can be to be afraid. Mm -hmm. You know, and to and, and to use your fear. And you he'd know, come from the stage, it. too, and a similar yeah. background, so he, he just knew. went, you are afraid. You mm -hmm. are afraid. And you will never, you know, you will always be, uh, he was like the first actor who said, you have to embrace that. You have to treat it with the respect that you treat your approach to a, a character. You have, to, you have to approach your fear side by side with that. Hmm. And I thought that was, uh, you know, I'll never forget that. And you earned your first Oscar nomination for that performance, which must have felt incredible and surreal. How did you, I guess, see yourself moving forward after that? Did you, you know, was your phone ringing off the hook? Did you, were you getting tons of offers? I mean, that was sort of a huge entree into oh, Hollywood. I just remember, like, going to the Academy Awards and our limo broke down because, <laughs> 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 because, Everybody's limos were breaking down oh because the, it, that was like a year where they didn't have it all figured out as to how you made your entrance to the to the, to the, the, the limo drop-off thing <laughs> was like it went bad that year. So <laughs> I'll have to look that up. The great I remember limo like Glenn Close was was um, was presenting best supporting actor, and that's like the second category of the evening. Very early. So and and I remember and Glenn was like eight and a half months pregnant, oh. and she ran by my limo. <laughs> <laughs> this is so not good. This is not good. And, and I didn't have my tickets because oh, I, I didn't have my tickets. And I went, hey, I'm going to be able to get in. <laughs> And then I couldn't get in. Oh no! They they wouldn't let me in the door. They were like, "You got to have your tickets." I was like, "I'm nominated," but you know. <laughs> so oh my that god! Was, <laughs> that was pretty funny. I mean, 
<laughs> when you finally got into the show where, and you found so, yourself sitting there, was, was this so when like, it was still at the shrine? No, I was so happy. Probably still I at the shrine. I think it was the shrine. Yeah. yeah it was the Did, shrine. How did it feel to see yourself mentioned with these other women? And were you able to appreciate it, I guess, is my question. Well, I just remember like, that when Cher won, she had to have like five people helping her up the because Bob she Mackie was wearing dress. a Bob Mackie gown. <laughs> and it was like she it was like she was in Vegas. And she had like showgirls. Remember the headdress, you know? that incredible like kind of amazing. Yeah, I mean, it was all so trippy. If you had to lose, you know. Losing. Yeah, you gotta lose to Cher. And and she was like the only person there in a designer gown. Because right. Bob Mackie, that was all there was. Right. And That's Cher right. was the only one wearing him. <laughs> so that what, I mean, what did you wear? How did people decide what to wear back then? Things are not. I mean, things are certainly crazy on that front now. I don't remember. Yes, yeah, completely transformed. It's yeah. entirely different. It's like now. a whole it's like a cottage industry within the business is just the dresses. But it is fun now. I mean, the dresses are fun. Yeah, there that's are a lot a, of options. That's a really kind of exciting part of. But 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 you know, it was nothing but. But you fun. have a great story though. That's way more interesting than I arrived at the Oscars and sat down. So now you, <laughs> way more interesting. Um, and then another bang up year on your resume was 1993, um, in which the piano and the firm both came out and both earned Oscar nominations and one win for the piano. Um, so it's interesting, I didn't know that you had played Helen Keller and now I think about you playing Ada. Very and different though. Very different, obviously. A a Ada is not actually somebody who's handicapped. Right, you know, that's she, true. She's, she's anything but. She chose not to. Right, you know, right, which is a highly different, thing. highly different, and she's obviously a grown woman. What What were your first reactions when you read the this? Script? Is a lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drink too much. <laughs> we may need to take an, inter an intermission. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> how How did the script for the piano come to you first? Did Jane reach out to you? Did you know her? How did that well, relationship I begin? Well, I remember I was at. Uh, there was an agent who did not represent me, who I liked a lot. Um, Tracy Jacobs was oh, her name. Hey, Tracy, yeah. And Tracy just called me and said, no, I was sitting next to her at like a, at Sundance, actually. I was at Sundance with a movie and she just, she was sitting next to me and she just said, listen, I read this script, wow. I read one of the greatest scripts I've ever read in my career wow. and you should read it. And so she sent it to me. It was not Jane being, her client? Not being my, my, not being my agent. Wow. You know, she was just, she, she had great taste. I would, you know, occasionally call Tracy and say, what do you got? What, what, do, you, what do you know? And you had another agent too? Yeah, who, who was in the <laughs> same firm as oh, Tracy. Okay, okay. They, were, they were buddies. Okay. So, um, and... Uh, Tracy's rep like Johnny Depp and just giant right, stars. Yeah. Right. But, um, and she was absolutely, wow. That is probably the greatest script I've, I've ever read. Mm. I mean, just uh, the way that Jane writes is so, so visual, so visceral, um, that you can feel the movie. I mean, the atmosphere that Jane Campion's movies create, she creates that on the page for the reader. Um, and, and you know, and her, her movies are so dense. There's such a density into how, they, how, they, how the world feels. Mm. You know, it's like it gets under your skin. Did you know her work when you read the script? Because um, she had done Sweetie, I think, at that point. I, she, I had seen Sweetie and I'd seen an angel at my table. You know, I, I, look, I wanted to work with her. You know? <coughs> so, yeah, I prepared. Um, uh, I got together with a Scottish a, a dialect coach to, to teach me a Scottish dialect and then I memorized the the bookend monologues, right, the, you know, the, 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 the book and the movie, and, and then I, I put together a piano, because I, I could play the piano fairly well, so I put together a, 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 a tape playing the, the piano, and, and then, you know, met her. Wow. And had Michael Nyman scored anything at that point? No. Okay. No. But you know he 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 you know sent me the pieces cool. as he wrote them. Okay. Well, you know three months before we started shooting, and then I could learn them as I went. Hmm. And what do you recall about casting the casting of Anna Paquin, who's just so magical as your daughter? Well, you Anna's Anna's sister was the one who her mother brought the sister in oh. to audition for the role, and Anna was there. And Jane said, why don't you audition too? 
<laughs> was she an actor? No. She'd never no. acted? She, she was like 11. She right? was nine. <laughs> nine. You know, she was nine and living in <laughs> New Zealand, no. Neither one of them were actresses. I mean, wow. you know, they just mm. responded to this kind of open call and Anna was a piece of magic mm. as, as she is. I don't know if you guys have seen the clip of her when she won the Oscar in her cute little hat. I mean, it really is one of the sweetest moments I've ever seen. Yeah, the best <laughs> acceptance speech ever. It is super quick, but she's just, she's so poised and so loving, and you could see in the audience when they pan to you and Jane, and just, there was such a, a kind of connection among you, you could sense it. Well, that was just, that was lucky for me. <laughs> the, the Anna was lucky for me. Oh. You know, she was, she was magical. You know, and she is magical. She's pretty wonderful. Yeah. And what were the most difficult elements of shooting the movie? It's a very physical movie. There's a lot of mud, a lot of scene. I mean, you imagine, like, remember the scene, like, dragging the piano into the house and the water. I mean, it's so, thinking back on it now, I don't, I don't think I fully grasp sort of, like, what a production that must have been for you. Well, but all those things are, you know, those are all kind of fun things, in fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mud, I mean, you could go, oh, you know, but it was great. <laughs> you like getting muddy. <laughs> you know, it was fun because it's all tools. It's like, mm. you know, they all inform the struggle of the character. You don't have to make this stuff up. You're living it. You're, you're right. in it. Um, I think, you know, for me, once again, it was the, the negotiation with my fear is that I don't do well performing. I, playing piano in front of people was like actually was pr paralyzing for me. So unlike performing, acting, I, I, I love to act in front of people. I love to, to be on stage. I love to um, perform for the camera. That's fun. There's, there's, there's an element, a giant element of it being a lot of fun hmm. too. But playing piano in front of people is not fun. Hmm. So I had to travel with that piano. That was my biggest that was my biggest challenge, was that the piano was a broken down piece of shit. <laughs> it was a piano that really and truly was built in the year 1850, so it didn't work. Wow. Um, it, there were many notes that didn't play. Mm -hmm. It sounded terrible. It sounded like you were hearing the notes played through wads and wads of cotton. Wow. You know, it was like muffled and barely, you could barely hear it. And that was, that was almost a nightmare. That was almost like <laughs> tragic. When I first <laughs> arrived and Jane said, here's the instrument. I was like, <laughs> so that I, I, I said, okay, this piano has to live with me. It, it's, it has to stay in my apartment. And whenever we travel from one location to another, and we traveled a lot, I said, the piano has to be moved from, from one apartment that I'm in to the next apartment. And then it has to be on the set. So this piano was <laughs> moving all the time because oh I only wanted to play it. Because wow. otherwise, I was going to divorce from it. Right. I was going to, I was going to, you know. Wow. So, so you had gone I, home to a really nice Steinway I at lived, night. I worked. lived with that piano. Wow. Do we know where the piano is now? With uh, Jane has it. She does. Yeah. Oh I mean, God. it's beautiful. It's a, it's it's a gorgeous instrument that you know has no real voice, which wow. was interesting because Ada didn't have a voice either, mm. you know. Wow. But I wanted that piano to have an incredible voice, and it did not. But at the end of the movie, in post production, I flew to Munich um, and replaced all of the the sound. I replaced all of the piano with the Munich Orchestra, um, <laughs> which that was another nightmare. <laughs> it was like, oh my God, now I have to play with an orchestra? I mean, oh my God, I'm so not a pianist. <laughs> it sounds like you are, though. It sounds like you are. But I mean, I took Valium and they gave me, you know, <laughs> a good German brew, you know that sat on the Bussendorfer, you know, and then I played as best I could, wow. you know, with the picture. Um, hmm. that, so that was, I mean, of, of all the things that I did, playing the piano for the crew, in front of the crew, and then playing the piano in Munich, that was by far and away the hardest thing that I did. 
the, the, the movie was actually kind of, you know, easy. Not mm. easy, but, but I had gone through the gauntlet of fear. I walked, I walked the, through the fire of fear mm. in broadcast news, and I've never felt that kind of fear since. It was like, okay. But, but playing the piano, that was, that was tough. <laughs> well, you did it beautifully. And tell me what it was like to work with Harvey Keitel. This is such a different role for him, but it's a joy. A, but really, he's, he, he created something so special and so unique. I, I don't think any of us have ever seen anything like this. Well, before. you know, I'm just kind of in love with Harvey. You know, I'm, I just have a huge crush on Harvey. <laughs> you know, I love Harvey. Um, and whenever I see him, it's just like, I just can't even believe how much I love him. Oh, you know, it's a nice feeling to have about people yeah, all these years later. I know, I know. So, I, and I think Harvey's also just like one of the most enticing great actors. And, and kind of like Bill Hurt also, you know, you cannot tell a lie with Harvey. <laughs> you cannot yeah. tell a lie. You have to be, you have to be there, hmm. you know. And so that was another one of the great privileges of my career to work with him. And how did it feel to win Best Actress when you when you were, saw yourself on well, that stage. That, well, that was a drag for Harvey not to be nominated. I really hated that. Yeah, I remember that. that. that was I didn't like that. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have to say. Okay. Just being honest. <laughs> you no. watched, but I, yeah. I, I just thought Harvey was so brilliant. He was. And so he, was. he just gave so much. We saw who Harvey is in that very performance. Very soul-bearing. Yeah. yeah, his soul. But it was very special to see you on the stage and you thank Jane and you thank your producer Jan. And, and you realize, you're thinking, and now with everything going on, and, and you think about, wow, this very female heavy production was not very common back then to have a female producer and a female director it's and Jane totally won for true. best screenplay that night. I mean, this is like kind of a unicorn moment at the Academy And you know Awards. what? It's, it's total, uh, totally interesting. And the other, you know, a, a, well, a few months ago was the first time I've ever been on a set where there was a female director and a female DP. Wow. And that is, that is so cool. I mean, mm -hmm. that was so rich. <laughs> um, it was just a richness that I've never experienced before in my career. I had it a few, you know, just doing this series that I'm doing right now. And it was like such a pleasure. It's nice. You know, to be photographed by a woman too. Um, and be directed by a woman. I don't know, it was just really, it's like we, we could use more of that, yes. you know? It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and The Firm came out that, that summer. I remember seeing it multiple times in the theater. And you think John Grisham book, you know, you think some kind of throwaway summer movie. This movie is a fantastic piece of film. Sidney Pollock directing, Tom Cruise, of course. How about Tom Cruise? I have to know what the Tom Cruise Tom experience was is. Tom really cool. Mm. I mean, Tom is, is, uh, Tom is a guy who, he is a fighter for mm. his character. He will fight for, he will fight for the downtrodden. Mm. I mean, there, if, if, if anybody on a set is not being treated well. Tom is like, he's, he's so proactive in that way. I so mm. appreciate it. I mean, he brings his heart to his work in a way that you might not, that you might not expect. I mean, although he brings his heart to his, his, his characters. I mean, I think, you know, once again, you really see Tom. Mm. Um, and he's very revealing of who he is. He brings it, he puts it on the table for you. Mm -hmm. And I actually found him a joy to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of loved doing The Firm. I loved that character. Well, and, and that character too, I think with another script, with another actor, with another director, I think it could have been kind of a throwaway part. But you brought so much, I don't know what it was, it was just so perfect, and Gary Busey was so perfect. Oh, I, I mean, loved Gary. It was short lived in the movie. You know, Gary, Gary, <laughs> Gary was also one of, you know, his trailer, the door was a, a, a swung wide. It was like, <laughs> come in and hang out. I mean, Gary was incredibly generous with himself. It seemed like everyone had fun making that movie. Yeah, and, yeah. and I loved the crew. I mean, it was a fantastic crew. You I mean, I was kind of the cover girl, so, like, whenever <laughs> it rained, they would have me come to Memphis. <laughs> um, you know, because all my, my work was in, uh, the in interiors. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, I particularly love that crew. It's a great movie, it really is. 
Um, and jumping ahead to 2003, another one of my favorites, 13, just kind of a shift for you. Beautiful, yeah. small little gem. Yeah, but I love 13. Yeah, it's. It, I, I love beautiful Hardwick. Movie. You know. Tell me about your relationship with her, because she's. Right. You remind me a lot of her, actually. I could see oh. you guys really. Uh, yeah, you know, we hit it connecting. off. Connecting. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Hardwick. I mean, you know that Catherine Hardwick. Uh, she directed the first installment of Twi you know, the Twilight mm -hmm. series, and. Uh, She's, you know, she, it would have been great for her to continue on with that mm -hmm. franchise. You know, that's... That was a huge deal. That was a, that was a huge deal. This was, was her first film after she was in her mid to late 40s, I think, when she made 13, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's been she, working she's a long time. unbelievably gifted mm -hmm. and uh, joyful. Brings her joy to the screen. Um, and when I met Catherine, I was like, because the, the movie was such a, an exotic the, the script was so exotic. I mean, it had been co-written by a 13-year-old girl and Catherine, and you could feel the 13-year-old girl in the script. It was like, oh, wow, what is that? I mean, it felt foreign. It's like, wow. <laughs> it felt like water. It was like, that thing's moving around, like 13-year-old girls do, you know? <laughs> and it was, in, right. it was in the DNA of the script. It's very raw. Kind of scary. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Exotic. Did they write this part for, with you in mind? I think they, well, look, I mean, it was, it was Nikki's mother. Hmm. So, like, they didn't write it. It was Nikki's mom. Right. It was Cheryl, right. you know, who I know and love. Um, so, but Catherine came, and then I met Catherine. I was like, oh, she's exotic, too. <laughs> because Catherine is, like, really a nervy, like, bold, um, fierce creature like very adventurous and like a creature <laughs> you know I really fun so I just felt like she brought this sense of mischief to the movie mm -hmm. I mean the movie is an, an embodiment of Catherine in a way uh, it's like guerrilla filmmaking yeah her, right. her rawness and her instincts and her intuitions and what she wants to see she like knows what she wants to see, and then she sees it. You know, it's, mm. it's she's really got a great impulse to action thing as a director. Mm. You know, what she wants, she gets, and I, I thought that was exciting. Is to that hear rare? Her. Do you think? Yeah, very, mm. very rare. She's very impulsive. Mm. And I've talked to Catherine about some of the creative ways that you saved money when you were making this. When making this movie, what do you recall about the, um, I guess, the budget nature of? <laughs> well, I mean, it was like production. you know, the hair and makeup trailer was you know this big. I mean, it was, and <laughs> I remember like they said, Holly, you know, Holly, we're ready for you, and uh, like I had one, one like eyeliner done, and <laughs> it, you know, I mean, we were on a serious. And the characters were some of Catherine's clothes and you drove yeah. one of her cars. I mean, it was really stripped down. But you know, but it was great because there was, there was a, it's like broadcast news and 13 have one thing in common. And that was that both movies, oddly enough, were shot almost in sequence. Mm. And broadcast news was an enor enormously ex expensive endeavor because of that. Because if you think, I mean, if you've seen the movie, there's these, um, the newsroom, you know, and all those extras in the newsroom, and all these locations that they held for four months wow. for the 16-week shoot, all those locations were held from beginning to end of the, you know, wow. which is incredibly expensive. Very this is downtown, this is downtown Washington, D.C., um, Did you do the interiors in LA for broadcast news, no, or was no. it all there? Oh wow! Yeah, there. And 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 so we shot the whole movie in sequence, which was incredible. I would love to do that every time. <laughs> and we shot <laughs> virtually all of thirteen in sequence because we were in that house. We were in this house where my character and my daughter live, and so we shot. Everything that in, in Venice? sequence. On the west side? In Venice. Mm. No, that was um, in the valley. It okay. looked like it was in Venice. Mm. But, oh, wow, that was really fun. What, did it, what was it like to work with Evan and Nikki, who were so young and so green, but so gifted? Crazy. Like, yeah. It was like nuts. <laughs> it was like, oh, wow, because they were 14. And I didn't have kids at that point. 
I was never around 14 year old girls. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> insane. They're overwhelming, aren't they? Like insane. <laughs> like, you know, was I like that? <clears throat> I mean, I didn't remember being like that. Right. But I was. Right. I was like that because that's what 14 year old girls, I mean, they, were, they had so much energy. And I have energy. a lot of energy, but like, I had nothing. I was like dead. <laughs> compared to that. <laughs> compared to that. It's like dead. Well, I'd been sure. dead for like six weeks <laughs> in comparison to what those girls were like. Wow. I'm sure they learned a lot from you. Wow. Nice. They, were, they were incredible. <laughs> you know. And did your, did your career shift at all after that? Did you start to want to do smaller scale productions? Did you find yourself wanting to have those connections again? Hello? No. <laughs> I mean, you know, as an actress, like, you know, you, you take what you get, man. You take what you can scrounge up from the gutter. Um, I mean, <laughs> like, you know, like if you live to be as, as if you live to be 59 or 60, you are no diva. Like, if you're still an actor, like, you know, you, 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 um, what is that song that Sondheim wrote? I mean, you're drinking champagne, you're drinking beer and pretzels. I mean, it's like, I'm still here. it's I'm like, still here, right? yeah, I mean, that's your life. I mean, um, you know, I've seen the good times, I've seen the bad times, <laughs> you know, I've seen the ebb and flow and any actress who's my age, who's still working, has seen some serious ebbs and flows. It's, it's the nature, it's the nature of my life and, and that's okay with me. Um, in a way, maybe there's, I don't know. Uh, but I will say that I, I did the series Saving Grace and it was a pleasure <laughs> and a privilege to do Saving Grace because the character was so full-bodied and lived such, a, in, uh, such an incredible sexual life. Yes, she did. And a life kind of um, on the outskirts uh, that and age was never even mentioned the entire time that I did the series. I mean, now I did 46 episodes and my age was never mentioned in, not even in a single episode. That's, there was no reference incredible. to anything like that. I was having sex with busboys, I was having sex with CEOs. Your colleagues um, at the police station? With, you know, with 19 year olds, with 60 year olds. I mean, I didn't care, my character didn't care. Um, <laughs> And that was really fun, fun, fun. <laughs> so she was acting like a man. <laughs> she was kind of, she was kind of, but she was also all woman too. Yeah, she's very um, soulful and written by a woman. Mm -hmm. So Did you guys watch Saving Grace? It was great, wasn't it? I was very sad to, but when but it ended. but it was a real, it was a real shock. It was mm -hmm. a real, it was real diving into the deep end of the pool of cold water mm -hmm. when Saving Grace ended because I went, oh yeah, welcome back. Right. to the real world of feature films right. where the, you know where this is now this is going to be tough right you know where there was no real use for me in a mm. leading role in in the world of features and that's still mm. i mean that's it's a, it's a dubious it's a dubious battle well, it's interesting. Um, you and Glenn Close both went to TV at the same time. Now, she and damages. Glenn, I talk about yeah. Glenn Close being like beyond brilliant and damages. Oh so my amazing. God! Yeah, she was amazing. unbelievable. Yeah, it was unbelievable seeing Glenn right. stretch out like that. Well, I think people you know, felt the same about you too, by the way. Well, I mean, Glenn is you know she's un unreal. She's she so is. talented and fun to watch. She is. So anyway, uh, yeah, that that was that, was that was, a, so that was a hard transition. That was one of show. my harder transitions that I've had hmm. because I was feasting, you know, at a banquet <laughs> at a banquet with Grace. And what then was I, it like to to actually play a character for multiple years? Because you hadn't had that opportunity before in terms of. TV well, or there's film. downsides to that. I mean, you know, you, the, you know, I think writing the writing for um, as I'm I'm. I'm working with Alan Ball right now and I'm having the privilege of working with Alan Ball because what Alan Ball can do is he, he sets this unbelievable stage and then, and then he <laughs> develops it. Hmm. And he's like, oh, I mean, he can just keep it coming. The way that he keeps unfolding and digging and pulling back layers and like ripping and, and unfolding and I mean he's got it all as a as a writer you know his gift he's got such depth as 
of an episodic writer. Um, he knows how to, to create the saga, you know, and have it just keep, become more and more deeply involving as you go. So that's... Mm. You're in good hands with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now we come to the big sick, which is the reason we're here today to celebrate your performance, which just earned an Indie Spirit nomination last week. Congratulations. <laughs> Very cool. Um, obviously, Kamel and Emily have talked probably ad nauseum, probably they never want to talk about it again, with you know, the source of information for the source of uh, inspiration for, this, for the script. But how did you become attached to this? Did you get the script? Did Judd, because I know you, Judd had told a story a few weeks ago that, or you told the story about how he came to an acting class that you were teaching. He was bringing his oh. daughter to campus. Right. <laughs> um, and did you meet then, or did... did we, 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 met, we, met, we met at Carnegie where, you know, I went. Um, that, I, so long ago, <laughs> was talking about Carnegie. I'm glad you guys are still awake. And, um, they are, they're riveted. Uh, no, I, well, I went back to Carnegie to, to teach an acting class, ha. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, basically I was just like encouraging these incredibly gifted students. But Judd Apatow was in, he was touring the campus with his daughter. Um, and so he sat in on the acting class that I kind of moderated. Um, and I got to, hmm. I got to meet him then. And then uh, uh, a few weeks later, they offered me The Big Sick. Um, and I wanted to do it because, you know, it's so obvious. I mean, it's such an incredible story. It is. Um, <coughs> such, a, such an unusual opportunity. And it was really fun to, to come to have a real close encounter with, like, straight up comedy mm -hmm. again. Right, because you hadn't done anything kind of lighthearted in a while. Well, I mean, was. Saving Grace had a tremendous amount of comedy in it. Right. Um, but this was just, you know, with all of these stand-up, you know, guys. Right. And How did you enjoy working with Ray? Because he's so well, wonderful in the movie, too. so much. I mean, that was, once again, an incredible privilege to get to work with somebody who was... Ray is so hardworking. He's so... Within his characters, he has such great ambition. Mm -hmm. um, he, he brings so much to the table. Um, so I, I felt like I had to really up my game to be with Ray. Hmm. Uh, and, and in no way, and, and at the same time, I, I was intimidated about, you know, being with all these stand-up comics. There's a lot of comedy people, yeah. But, you know, they made it you so You held easy. your own, Holly. You held your own. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you meet or interact at all with Emily's mother? Never did. You never did? Okay. Never did. I wasn't sure how much of what we saw on screen was reflective of what actually happened with her parents, you know, with the infidelity and that kind of thing. I couldn't tell no. if that was actually part of what happened in real life. No, I mean, uh, of, of, of the big sick, the one fictionalized part really was kind of the, 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 the mother. The parents stuff. Okay. Uh, the, the mother and uh, father. Okay. Um, I mean, it's interesting because with 13, I hung out incessantly with Cheryl, who I was playing. Right. And with The Big Sick, I never even had a phone conversation with her because I want, because it felt so fictionalized that I wanted to be fictional. I wanted to, and also like her, what she did for a living, The, her, her professional life didn't come into play at all. Hmm. So I just wanted to make her up, hmm. which is what I normally do, which is what actors normally do. Right. You're normally not playing a real, <clears throat> a real life person. Well, I'm sure that's what Emily wanted too. This was a reinvention of... Yeah, and her parents had never had you know, an affair. I mean, all hmm. that stuff was made up. So Ray, and, Ray, didn't, Ray also didn't speak with the father. Okay. Um, and we didn't do that together. We didn't make that decision, just neither one of us did that. Hmm. And what did you learn working with Judd, who's obviously not only has a great eye for talent and, and comedy, but he does have this way of infusing <coughs> his stories with a lot of heart, and it's ultimately about well, family and relationships. And yeah, and I saw This Is 40, and I just thought This Is 40 had elements to it that were, all, that were so amazing because he was using his real family, <coughs> and the fact that he could that he that they all had the freedom to express themselves and their family dynamic on screen was that was a big risk that was a huge risk that totally paid off yeah. 
I mean, that was really, that was exotic <laughs> to see um, his wife's relationship with their kids on screen. I mean, I saw immediately that there was an intimacy that was real. Hmm. And I didn't even know that that had happened. When I saw hmm. This is 40, I didn't realize that was his family. Oh, wow. um, but Judd is very discerning, very discerning. Um, v he watches with such a critical eye and, and with such kindness. I mean, he's an inc he is a true collaborator. The, the big sick, when, they, when Barry Mendel called me and offered me the job, he just said, look, you know, this is gonna be a real collaboration. And it was like, he, he really meant it. Hmm. Um, a more collaborative experience I've never had. Hmm. Um, that was the most collaboration you could ever have. Wow. Um, and Michael Showalter obviously directed, and he comes from, obviously, zany improv comedy world. He's, this is his whole life is collaborating. Totally. On, the, on that level. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it does come with, from the fact that they're stand-ups. Right. That they, they, their world happens very quickly. Hmm. They give and take. Um, did he let you guys improv much? We did. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of that movie was discovered in rehearsal, and there was a tremendous amount of rehearsal for, hmm. for the film, um, much more than normal. Hmm. Uh, we read and reread and talked, uh, and the scenes were thrown out and reshaped and redefined um, and rewritten. Uh, the th it was constantly in a in a kind of a metamorphosis, um, uh, a metamorphosizing, a metamorphosing <laughs> state until we shot. Wow! So that when we shot, the thing went really quickly because we were very familiar with each other, very familiar with um, uh, the dynamic, the tone of each scene. Hmm. And what do you think this movie means to you for your career now? How do you think it's emblematic of the type of work you want to do or, or maybe where you are in your life? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to say, you know, because once again, an actor's career is always in a state of metamorphosis, you know, there's no, nothing is set in stone. I, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in two months. <laughs> will, where will I be in two months? I don't even, you know, geographically, I live in New York, but maybe I won't be there. Because, I mean, there's always, a, a, there's always the lottery. The lottery is always part of my life. You know, hmm. oh, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> or so you're always buying a ticket then. Or you know, no, we can't go out to dinner tonight. <laughs> you know, now let's save some money. I mean, it's either like yes, um, or no. Um, so, so you're open. Th there's there's a part of that about my life dynamic that I love because it is uncertain and unknown. Um, and of course, there's part of that that I resent, mm -hmm. but I've learned certainly to live with it in a way to thrive with it no matter what, mm -hmm. you know, um, to thrive behind the scenes if I'm not thriving in front of the camera. I mean, th my life, I want it to be thriving all the time, mm -hmm. regardless of what's going on with my career. But I think, you know, I want to keep it real. I, I mean, I want to keep my face real. You know, I mean, as, as actresses get older, particularly actresses, I mean, there's sometimes I, I want to be recognized. I mean, I want people to, to understand my face. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I don't want to do stuff to my face where people don't recognize me anymore. I think that's Holly Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think that's, that's always a negotiation that actresses have to have, like, you know, because you want people, you want to be photographable, mm -hmm. but you also want to get older, you know, because that's real. Mm -hmm. So that's also a dynamic that I think that all actresses have to kind of politically skirt, you know, you got to be surfing the wave of, <laughs> like, 
You want to you want to look like where people want to look at you, but at the same time, <laughs> but I but I I don't want people to wonder who I am. Mm. Right. So I mean that's but that and 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 that's something that's a that, practical like, concern, by the way. It's yeah. a total practical concern, and um, but something that I kind of feel at home with, because. I don't, I, I'm not interested in fooling people too, too much. And so, I mean, The Big Sick, as I get older and a movie like The Big Sick, you know, happens and I'm playing, you know, I'm playing someone like that and, it, and there's a connection with the audience. What it is, it's a validation. It's a continual validation of like, as I, as I go through a 30 and, and, and possibly, you know, 40 year career, um, that, that's good. People still want to, they want to make connections with their own humanity. They want to make a connection with what, with their, with a recognition of themselves. Mm -hmm. What they are going through. What, what I want to feel that well, as an audience member. I, I connect with that desire, with that loss, with that need, with that fear, with that love, with that, um, uh, with that rejection. I mean, all the things that characters go through on screen, I want the audience connect to, to connect with mine because that's what I have to give. So that humanity, you know, the big sick, it connects with an audience and I feel privileged. And that's great, man. That's all you want as an actor. And that's all you want as an audience member too, is to, is to have that hookup, you know. Well, whatever you're doing, you're keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's keep, yeah. Thank you for that. So we have a lot of great um, audience questions, so I want to make sure we get to them. So the first one's from Hannah. Where is Hannah? Oh, Hannah. Oh, hi. Hey. Amazing penmanship, I must say. Really, quite extraordinary. Let me see. Really, look at this. It's like a greeting Damn. card. I mean, I, I normally need glasses. Okay, but let me see. <laughs> I really respect how your performances seem to look. Um, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Let, let me do the reading. <laughs> Seem to lack any self consciousness. Do you have any tips for achieving that in our own performances? And how do you get and stay out of your head? Wow, that's great. That's such. That's a question that only an actor could ask. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> we have no days. one. No <laughs> one would ever think to ask that except for an actress or an actor. Um, how do you stay out of your head? Wow. That's tough. I mean, you know, it's, it is. It's a matter of relaxation and, and you know, it's, it's very difficult. You know, sometimes I do this, this crazy thing where I will, um, well, I always think of like, of, of, like, is my character coming from the outside in? Like, if I'm coming from outside, I, you know, people are different when they come from outside into a room. I think of stuff like that. Stuff like that absorbs me. Like, you know, I will just get my breath going. Um, I'll jump up and down. If, I'm, if I've been running, then I'll, I'll, I will get out of breath for the scene so that my center will feel different, my breath will flow differently. I mean, I will just do things. I'll watch myself in between takes, and sometimes in between takes, I'll go, oh, what I'm doing right now is what I really should be doing in the scene. Now that I'm in between takes, and the focus is off of me, this is what I really want to do when the camera rolls. So I will, I will observe myself all the time and go, this is where it lives. Um, or sometimes I will go, I will go second. A lot of actors want to go first on their coverage and I will go second because, because while the other actors being photographed, I can observe myself unobserved for how I with, a, with more relaxation. It's like, it's so much about relaxation, it's not funny. Hmm. Um, <laughs> that's why the fear thing is so enticing for me to find that balance because, because you need both, I think, in a way, as a, as a performer. But, I mean, these are just some of the crazy ways I try to stay out of my head. 
is, is just, I try to keep the circumstances as real as possible. Like if I'm talking to somebody on the phone, I will have the person on the phone. I will, I will say I really need the other actor to be on the phone so that I'm not faking it. Because we talk on the phone. We know what that sounds like. We, you, you see when somebody's faking it. You know, so don't fake it. Have somebody really on the other, other end of the line. Um, if, the, if they say, can you look at the X on the mat box? I go, no, I need to look in a person's eyes because I, I act differently if I'm looking at somebody re really. The, um, just all these little things that are, they're not about being smart, they're about being authentic. Um, I try to fulfill as many of the reality circumstances as I can. Hmm. Um, and that keeps, tends to keep me out of my head. Um, and it sounds simplistic, but I work with a lot of actors and a lot of people don't do it. And I go, wow, they can do that. I can't. I have to keep it, I have to, to I don't want to depend for everything, well, for my imagination on everything. You're, hmm. you're you know, I will cheat as much as I can with what's real. That's great. Uh, the next question is from Susan, and I was going to ask this too, but I saw the question, so I held back. Susan would like to know, did you get any flack for your southern accent when you first started? Well, um, no, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's always so interesting when actors you know, when I hit New York City in 1980, that it was it was good. Hmm. I mean, my timing, the parts that were offered to me, it, it 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 that was good. That was okay. I mean, I mean, I've done roles without a southern accent um, that have been really fun for me. I mean, and I and for this Alan Ball series, I'm also working without an accent, which is really a joy. I mean, it's really fun. It was fun to, to play Ada in uh, the piano without one. Um, and at the same time, it's also fun to, for people to be from somewhere, which I think as the world goes on, there is more of an, uh, an, um, uh, an homogenous kind of uh, look to things, uh, a feeling to things. I love the visceral quality of being from a place and have a character, the orientation, be strong. I think that there's, there's something about that, that that's, that's, that's great, that's a, that, that feels good. And it's also great to depart. Well, it especially worked for The Big Sick because that's what the movie's about, is sort of being from a place, assimilating, but still maintaining your identity. Right. right. I thought it worked very well. Um, this is from Fiona, also great penmanship. Fiona. <laughs> There's Fiona. How do you approach a new character? What is your process for creating a new role? Um, well, I mean, well, I, I, I'm, uh, it kind of changes from character to character, but, but like with this, with Alan Ball's series, um, I started with a, a, a dialect coach. I really wanted a very, I wanted to find a voice. I didn't even know what the voice was. Is it higher than mine or lower than mine? I mean, you know, what is the tenor of the voice? Um, with the big sick, um, I started with the rehearsal process. It's like, I wanted to get together with, with Mike, the director, and Kumail in a room and talk to them about the, the script, talk to them about the scenes, talk to them about the conflict. What is this conflict? And so, you know, with The Big Sick, it was a totally different, totally different process. I mean, we found that movie, you know, actors and characters, I think, in, in rehearsal. And that's almost never done. You know, I mean, I do plenty of movies where there's no rehearsal at all. So that was unusual for that to be the revelation. Hmm. Um, if I'm playing a, 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 
a professional role if, if I like for 13 I didn't do anybody's hair because I wouldn't want to ruin anybody's hair <laughs> but um, it was it was fun to immerse like to have my hands covered with dye because I saw that Cheryl's hands were like permanently her nails were embedded mm. with hair dye and I just those kinds of details I wanted to feel that reality I wanted to have I wanted the audience to feel that the visceral nature of her profession to manifest itself just even something that small if I look down at my own hands um, it just takes me, I, I takes me someplace else. I mean, it's a very private thing. Sometimes I do things that don't show up on screen at all, except for maybe just a wash, because I do it only for my own self. That's great. This is from Paul. Um, Paul is saying, we come here for inspiration. What moments have you witnessed on set in your career that have continued to inspire you? What moments have I, what, where, Paul, Paul, where are you? Yeah. Okay. Just like at what actors have you witnessed either right across from you or elsewhere on set that inspired you? Who were on set with me? Who who've, have inspired me? Yeah. Um, well, you know, we've talked about some of them today. You know, I mean, with the kind of indelible imprint that Anna Paquin and Bill Hurd and Harvey Keitel. Um, but I'm working with an actor, Daniel Zavato, right now. He's a young actor. I, Daniel may be 22, and he inspires me. His, he's doing the Alan Ball series as well. And his approach to the work is very private and very personal. And I so appreciate that. You know, I find that very special. I mean, it, it, it inspires me. It, it makes me feel closer to myself to see an actor um, have a, a private connection with the scenes. I mean, I love that. I mean, you know, it makes me feel privileged to be an actor, to be, and, 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 it, and it gives me more of a license to do that myself. And it's so wonderful to be working with a young actor who I feel has that. And Sosie Bacon also is a, a young actress. She's Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick's daughter. She's and so she's good. just got this marvelous fluidity. I mean, a marvelous, like, um, liquid quality. You know, she's, she could, she's a movable feast. Um, <laughs> And so those two actors, I'm working with them now, and I just find them so enlivening to be on a set with such young energy that, that feeds me. That's great. Uh, this is a great is from, question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. This is from Asante. Where's Asante? Hello. Hey. Um, and I was going to ask this as well, but I held back because I wanted to look. Okay, Asante, what is it? <laughs> oh, um, well, one of the first projects that I, I watched from you was uh, growing up watching The Incredibles, the movie that you did. So me and my sister loved it, but one of my questions was, what's the difference from voice acting and on-camera acting that you found? Like, monstrous, monstrously different. I mean, it's so different. I don't know if you guys heard, but what's the difference between on-camera acting and doing, like, a voiceover? It's, like, so com wild, wildly different. Like, for the, we're doing The Incredibles part two right now. Yeah. And, and I know it's so, so fun. It's, it's so cool. Um, but I, I'm in a room. I don't know the story. Um, I still, I mean, we're almost done. I still don't really know the story. I mean, I'm recording, you know, on Friday uh, for one of my last recording sessions. And... I'm there by myself with Brad Bird. I, I had never met Mr. Incredible until like <laughs> two months ago. We did The Incredibles like 12 years ago or whatever it was. And I met him like two months ago. For, for Craig, T. Nel Craig T. Nelson, who plays my husband. We met, you know, at com kind of a Comic-Con type thing. That's anyway, amazing. I'm with Brad and 
I stand at the microphone and Brad's, you know, Brad, and, and it's just, you know, and he, like, he acts all the parts. <laughs> and, and then I do Mrs. Incredible. And, and I've got my lines on big, you know, cardboard, you know, big cardboard things. And, and I have to um, practice the lines a little bit before we do it because I've never seen them before. And then we record. And he gives me direction. He's kind of a genius, Brad, a bit of a genius. <laughs> so he gives me different feedback, you know, different ways to do it. His vocabulary is incredible, you know. So it's really fun, really fun, really like um, can be real loosey-goosey, um, kind of like just playing around. <laughs> Like you're playing around, <laughs> like you're kidding around, and you know you do, and, and then you move on. Um, what was it like to see the first movie when it was done? I, I was shocked. <laughs> I was I bet shocked. your kids enjoyed seeing that. I mean, I had no idea it was going to be that good. <laughs> I mean, because The Incredibles, I think, is great. Is just this phenomenal thing. I think the movie's kind of phenomenal. It is. It's so round. <laughs> it's such a round experience yeah. of like, you know, being a kid and being an adult and, you know, it's, a, it, it's such an, an immersive experience emotionally, hmm. you know, so satisfying. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, uh, so I, and I think, you know, The Incredibles Part 2 is going to be great. <laughs> I think as far it's as you know. So great. <laughs> <laughs> And final question, we've touched a little bit on this, but maybe you have a kind of final succinct thought from Katie. Where's Katie? I'm in the back. Katie, Katie says her biggest challenge is trust and belief in herself. Do you have a mantra or an inner monologue that you say to yourself in times of weakness? God, another great question. Well, I mean, I, Um, God, that's such a great question. Sometimes, I, I, that's such a great question. And like I, like I, I, I said to earlier, and I think it was Hannah's question about, um, relaxation or but there's two, th that makes me think of two things. One is try your damnedest to not ever express displeasure when you're working. Take the displeasure and have it go underground into the character. So if you are displeased, or if you are annoyed, or if you are enraged, or if you are irritated, or if you are any of these negative things, don't give voice to them. Take it in, and it will come out of your instrument in a creative way, even if it's incredibly positive. Maybe it will fuel your glee, you know, maybe your glee and the scene will have an underbelly to it. Uh, I mean, that's one thing. And two, I worked, I had the pleasure of working with Billie Jean King when I was, I, would, I did this movie years ago, and Billy, and I got to know Billy. And Billy's mantra is champions adjust. And, and I was like, you know, and Billy's so unbelievably positive, you can't get over it. I mean, her positivity is fueled like jet fueled her, her life, jet fueled her life. So I kind of, I started going, when, when things got bad, I would go in myself, I go, I'm a champion. I'm a champion. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when, when the chips are down for me, and I mean, nobody, maybe nobody else knows they're down, 
but inside I'm like, I am fucked. You know? <laughs> We've all uh, felt that way. This is so <laughs> fucked. I am never, I am never gonna get, I'm, ne I'm never gonna climb out of this, whatever. I go, yeah, but I'm a champion. And, and, and it, 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 it uh, because I, I got that from, because Billy's champions adjust thing, you know, is, is really powerful. Um, you know, it's just another trick that I play on myself. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing advice. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, guys. Thank you.